Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. What is up, Heart Wisdom fam? I hope you're doing beautifully today and shining your light as a beacon of loving awareness to help illuminate all that you touch in this world. I am Ganesh Braymiller, Jack's media manager, content specialist, and lion's mane drinking elephant, back to introduce another fine episode of Heart Wisdom, this week heralding from a Dharma talk landing on 10-1 of 2001. But... Before picking the abundant flowers from the prospering garden of this radiant discussion, I want to get our hands into the enriching soil of some truly blooming offerings we have been watering with these warm and nurturing spring rains. Firstly, though, let's take it to the clouds. Cloud Sangha, Tara Brock, and Jack's brainchild for fostering digital community connections just opened two new Jack Cornfield focus groups, Loving Kindness and Buddhist Wisdom. Connect with Sangha weekly to explore Jack's teachings, Learn how to apply them to daily life, connect with peers by sharing your experience, and cultivate a heart-centered practice within community. You can do this all by signing up at cloudsanga.co slash Jack Cornfield. Then, join Jack as he and creator of ChatGPT, Sam Altman, connect at Wisdom 2.0 2023 together for a pivotal session diving into the hot intersecting topics of spirituality and AI technology. Wisdom 2.0 2023 Together will take place April 27th through 29th. Then, join Jack and his beloved Trudy Goodman as they once again team up as the dynamic duo for Wisdom 2.0, Journey of Relationships. This online event will span the entire month of May, with Jack and Trudy's session landing on May 19th. And finally, we've been working diligently to create wonderful new online courses pulling back the veil on topics like Buddhist psychology, mindfulness, and Buddha nature. These and more are now available on the new jackcornfield.com. Now, as we have in previous weeks, let's swan dive into the rasa, the juice of this dope episode. Heart Wisdom 184 is appropriately titled Listening to Find the Way and takes place just after the September 11th terrorist attacks, creating a rather interesting mental-emotional climate for a Dharma talk. Through this lens, uncovering how we can live with a peaceful heart, Jack maps the inner landscapes of meditation and shares how we can use listening to find the way. Throughout this talk, Jack sends out potent reminders of how and why living with a peaceful heart in a truly balanced and open listening can transform our lives and the lives of those around us. He's quoted saying, A peaceful heart is not a withdrawal from life, but rather coming back into ourselves to remember the place that neither grasps nor judges and hates. He also shares, your heart is trustworthy when you listen to it. So, here is an opportunity for you not only to listen to the wonderful and illuminating Jack Cornfield, but an opportunity for you to listen to your own heart. Remember, even when you think information is coming in from the outside, you still have to put it through your own filter and decide for yourself whether it rings true. So, trust your heart. Trust your body and trust your being, for this deep, intuitive inner listening is truly a doorway to loving awareness. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be at ease. May you manifest your most beneficial desires. And may you offer kindness, love, and wisdom wherever you happen to be. See you next week, fam. Namaste. Over the past weeks um, since the terrorist attack in New York um, as I said there have been a lot of people coming here to Spirit Rock Um, and I think for all of us or for many of us there's just a a deep pull to um, sanctuary to find places that feel peaceful, um, and for community when things are so volatile and so difficult to be able to find a way 
to connect with one another. So we've had a series of both vigils and uh, um, councils and circles where people could really speak from the wisdom and the understanding that they have and that we could hear one another in addressing what is uh, both painful and frightening and difficult. So I welcome you back to this Monday night group as part of that sanctuary. The phrase that begins many of the Buddhist texts is these words, O nobly born, O you who are the sons and daughters of the Buddha, do not forget who you really are. Do not forget your birthright, your true nature. In some way, to come into sanctuary or to come to meditate together, to come as we have just now to sit, is simply to quiet ourselves enough to remember the values of the heart that we hold most dear, to get in touch with that place of wisdom in ourselves. Thich Nhat Hanh, when he spoke in Oakland a couple of weeks ago, shortly after the New York uh, terrorist attack, um, talked about living in Vietnam during the war and how remarkable it was when they had days where the bombing was called off because there were some peace talks or there was some particular holiday and it would be announced that there would be no bombings on those days or for that week. And he said, all of a sudden we could look up at the sky and see the blue of the sky and see the green beauty of our mountains and hills and of the rice paddies and the flowers that surrounded us. And it was such a treasure to have days between the bombings. I feel very grateful that we haven't gone to war yet. Really grateful for these days where we've been on the verge as a nation of some kind of war. And I feel as we sit with it as a nation that it becomes more thoughtful and more considered and more uh, nuanced and not just a big reaction that even among the leadership or among the people who might have been the most immediately vociferous and, and uh, um, reactive, that there's been some tempering as we listen and pay attention. And so I'm very happy for these days. The quality of sanctuary, whether it is the time be- bef- between the bombings, as Thich Nhat Hanh spoke about, um, or the quality in coming into community in sanctuary, is a place where we can quiet our minds, quiet the mind and open the heart. Saint John of the Cross said, let the heart be still, for disquietude is always vanity. This was his phrase. Disquietude, agitation, all those things, is always vanity, which I think is a kind of quaint Victorian way of saying that our ego gets mixed up in all the things we have to react and do and what's right and what's wrong. And that that agitation is actually um, not the truest understanding of our heart. Disquietude is vanity. Let the heart be still. What does it mean to have a peaceful heart? Is it a withdrawal from the world? Some texts tonight from various parts of the Buddhist teachings. There are three ways of seeing life, says the Buddha in the Anguttara Nikaya. In one, people grasp and hold it fast. In another, they go to an excess. And in the third, they see wisely. In the first way, people grasp after all the things of life, possessions and happenings and families, and continuation of things being the way they were. And when a teaching is offered that advises compassion and going beyond the dictates of a small sense of self, their heart does not leap up and they are not so attracted to it. 
In the second way, people are afflicted by the opposite, judgment and hatred of life. They are just as attached to life, but in a negative way. They revile it and make a bad thing of it to excess. And in the way of wisdom, people see life as it is, forever being born and changing its form, ceasing to be. They accept life willingly and are neither overly attached nor do they despair. And it is those who come to know the wisdom of the heart. So a peaceful heart is not a withdrawal from life, but rather coming back in ourselves to remember the place that neither grasps nor judges and hates. To sit still, as we did this evening, amidst the facts of birth and death, of joy and sorrow, of praise and blame, gain and loss. Because each day so many people are born on this earth. 250,000 people were born today. And 200 some thousand died. There's more born than died these days. Extraordinary, every day. To sit in the midst of birth that is true and death that is true, of joy and sorrow and praise and blame and gain and loss. This is this human life as we've been given it. And allow it to untangle, to show itself to us in its true nature. From the Visuddhimagga, one of the great Buddhist texts, someone asked the Buddha, this world seems so entangled in a tangle How does one succeed in disentangling this world? And the Buddha replied, only when a person becomes attentive and kind and establishes a greater consciousness through ardent and wise practice can they understand the tangle and release themselves from it. When a person becomes attentive and kind, Those are the prerequisites. And sees the world clearly with a kind and attentive heart. To be still inwardly, the invitation of stillness, does not mean that we don't act, but rather that we act from a clear mind and a wise heart. As it says, in the Tao Te Ching. Fill your bowl to the brim and it will spill. Keep sharpening your knife and it will blunt. Chase after security and property and your heart will never unclench. Care about people's approval and you will be their prisoner. Do you work with love then step back without attachment. This is the path to serenity. Do you have the constancy to wait until the mud settles and the water is clear? Can you remain unmoving until the action of the heart arises by itself? So it's not inaction, but action that comes from the place of wisdom whether it's in our families, you know those little arguments that might happen, conflicts, whether it's in our work or communities, or on a global level, it's the same. So how to respond to the destruction in New York, to the complexity of what's happening in the world, it's confusing to the uncertainty in the mind, If you notice and listen kind of in a political level, you begin to hear that people on the left and people on the right both claim that this shows that they were correct in their view of the world. Have you noticed that? (laughs) That the people on the right might say, we need more military strength. There is conspiracies that we have to be wary of. We need greater security. All this proves that. Yes? And then the voices on the left say, 
No, you know, what this proves is that there are certain actions that the U.S. has taken that are unjust and conditions that we have helped to foment in the Middle East and elsewhere that's, that uh, supports this terrorism happening, and we have to pay attention to that. And everybody says, see, I saw it correctly, and this justifies it. Have you noticed that? So how do we see, how do we see these events? Because in learning to see these events, we can learn to see our own world more clearly. The state of our mind and our heart determines what we see, like those on the left and those on the right, equally. There is a story of the quite highly respected a primate biologist and scientist named George Schaller, who wrote a book called The Year of the Gorilla. And he was the person that the work of Diane Fossey was inspired. Diane Fossey was inspired by him and kind of followed his work to live with the mountain gorillas. And he was the first primate biologist to actually learn the life of the tribes of the gorillas there. And he did it because he was able to get closer and bring far more sophistication in his observation and his being with those creatures than anyone had done previously. And when he was asked how was he able to do that, he attributed it to one thing. He said, I didn't carry a rifle. I didn't carry a gun. Because in all the previous years, the people who had studied the gorillas had seen them as dangerous creatures. And so they carried their rifles and they marched in and they were worried about what the gorillas would do and they were there with their guns and they had a certain kind of presence. And sure enough, the gorillas were dangerous and they ended up shooting some of them. But what George Schaller did was to not carry a gun and not see them as dangerous and instead he entered their territory and treated them with respect rather than fear and all of that that the rifle implied. And because he treated them with respect, because he knew that he didn't have a gun to defend himself, so what defended him was his attention and his care and his respect. They equally respected him. And he was able to get closer to them and understand them in a way that no one had before. How we approach the gorillas you know, and I like to tell this story, I guess I'll throw it in tonight. Um, one of my friends who has sat here on and off over many years, Lisa Hamburger is her name, is the primate curator at the San Francisco Zoo. And she invited my daughter and my daughter's school class to go down and be with the primates at the zoo. And we went in and we met the chimpanzees. It was very exciting because these were lots of little kids as well and they were very, very happy about that. And then it was time to go and meet the gorillas, you know, and especially the head of the gorilla clan there, which was this great big silverback. And she said, do you know how, to, how you approach a gorilla? Because that sounds like a kid's joke, right? How you approach a gorilla right? carefully or whatever George did. <clears throat> And she said, the way that you approach a gorilla, first of all, is to keep your eyes down so that you're not threatening by the way you look at them. Secondly, it's good if you hunch over a little bit or even sidle up a little, kind of come from the back rather than marching straight forward. And then to get their attention, what you need to do is to clear your throat, <clears throat> like that. So there we are at the zoo with this class of all these little kids, right? And we go, there's the enclosure for the gorillas. And there's a million people going by with baby strollers and, you know, um, popcorn and, and radios and just the whole thing of the zoo, right? And the gorillas are completely ignoring all these people that go by. And then here comes this class of little kids who go up and they kind of sidle up. They look down a little and they sidle up and then they go, <coughs> you know, that? And immediately the silverback looks up like you called someone paying attention and turned around and looked at them and the other gorillas came and paid attention to them. So how we approach another being, another living being, or in fact what is in our mind as we approach life, 
will determine how it responds to us. What is true power? Is it the power over another that those men with rifles demonstrated? Or maybe, as the Buddha points to, is it the power over one's own mind? The mind is the forerunner of all things, says the Buddha. All things follow from the mind. How can a troubled mind understand the way? Your worst enemy cannot harm you as much as your own thoughts unguarded. But once mastered, no one can help you as much, not even your loving father or mother. So is it power over another or power over one's own mind? When we undertake a meditation practice, there's this invitation to stillness, to breathe, to become present. And even though it doesn't work very well, I know that. You're sitting there and you're thinking about all kinds of stuff. Everybody does that. You know, fess up, right? But still, there get to be moments, there are gaps where you realize, oh, there's the breath. Even if it's just one breath or two breaths, here I am sitting here instead of being on the freeway and thinking about all these other things. And in those moments, the mind begins to settle a little bit. The body begins to soften. The heart begins to relax. And so much trauma has been activated in this last week's The trauma of New York touched all the fears and traumas in so many people. So then just to come and breathe and sit, even one breath attended to, things start to settle a little bit. And as we sit, as you sit, you can begin to notice the interior landscape, the, the fears and the joys and all the emotions, the grief that's there the breaking of the heart, compassion for everybody that was involved, all those images, and for others in the world. Because if we really listen inside, it's not just them who suffer, or even them who struggle, but we all struggle. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote, if only there were evil people out there insidiously committing evil deeds, and it was simply necessary to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being, and who among us is willing to destroy a piece of their own heart? So we see, even in the painful things, sometimes an echo in our own heart and compassion for all the suffering, it really, it breaks your heart sometimes just to look and let yourself feel. But at the same time, we can also notice, if we look inwardly, that we're aware of all this. I'm aware that my heart is breaking. I'm aware that they're not the only people who are angry in the world. I too get angry. They're not the only people that blame. And all of a sudden, we begin to notice that with all the things that happen, there is this quality of knowing, oh, I am aware of all this. I'm aware of my sadness. I'm aware that I'm frightened now. I'm aware of searching for clarity, of looking, how would one find forgiveness in this? What does compassion mean? And if we look into that awareness itself, if we pay attention not just to the heart, that opens and breaks and feels all these things, but to the witnessing of it. Then we begin to sense what is always here that my teacher Ajahn Chah called the one who knows. That consciousness that is present within which, that awareness that's timeless, within which the whole drama of life, of birth and death and joy and sorrow, plays itself out, and yet we sit and say, this too, this too, all of it. And we begin to recognize that the heart holds the whole world and that this great openness of mind that is always knowing is here to know and see and yet in some way 
remains pure. Look and see if this is not so. It is a challenge to us in difficult times to be still because we so easily react to still ourselves and then see the deepest or the greater truth, the greatest truth that we can see from. But if you become still, at least as I've sat and become still, some things, even in the difficulties, become again and again evident. These greater truths, one might call them. One is very simple, that retaliation and revenge never work. I mean, there might be a place for international justice, for apprehending criminals who murder and kill in terrible ways and bringing them to justice, but to retaliate, to seek revenge, never, ever works. As the Buddha says, hatred never ceases by hatred, but by love alone is healed. This is the ancient an eternal law. It's never worked in this world before or still now. Listen and see if that is not true in your own knowing. What else can we see? At least what else I'm seeing as I sit. We can sit and see or feel the underlying cause of human suffering and sorrow. What the Buddha taught as the noble truths, the four noble truths, the first noble truth of the fact of suffering in human life that we all know, and the second of the cause of human suffering, which is greed, hatred, and ignorance or delusion. And it has been the cause of human suffering in the past, and it is the cause of human suffering on this very day and in this very month. If you want to get rid of your em- enemy, it says in the Kagon Sutra, the true way is to realize that your em- enemy is delusion, that your enemy is ignorance in this world. And out of ignorance is born hatred and greed. And out of that, all the forms of suffering that we have experienced recently. And if we pay attention, we see it on all sides. There is a terrible feeding of hatred among the fundamentalists and the terrorists in the Middle East. And you could see it in Bosnia, you know, and in Serbia, in the Balkans, there were people who came to power and fed nationalism and hatred of other people using the newspapers, using the radios, using old history and wounds. And they got whole nations riled up to kill one another. This is ignorance and hatred on the part of the terrorists. We can also see the elements of greed, hatred, and delusion that have operated on the part of the United States as some of the greater conditions that allow the suffering to explode in this way without justifying it all. But if we look, I mean, the Sunday editorial in the San Francisco Chronicle started to catalog the things that we might reflect on beginning with the Crusades, you know, and going on to the support of despots throughout the Middle East and the colonial governments, the British and the French and the others, carving up and and exploiting countries there. And the fact of American racism and the militarization of that region and the fact that we export so many weapons to so many countries in the Middle East. We armed Iraq. We're the ones that armed Iraq. And we armed, we arm Egypt and we arm Israel. We are the greatest arms supplier in the face of the earth. And we wonder 
about our security. Or if we look economically, as the CIA is fond of saying, follow the money. The Chronicle suggests follow the money. Look at the region's oil interests and you'll understand a whole lot of the politics. Greed, hatred, and delusion. So first, the realization that revenge and retaliation never were. Justice, yes, but also hatred never ends by adding hatred to it. Secondly, looking at the causes of things. It said, um, it's critical that uh, uh, from uh, uh, our position of suffering, we have to look into the causes. And greed, hatred, and delusion have always been the causes of human suffering. As long as they operate, the world will suffer. The more there is, the more we suffer. The less there is, the less suffering there will be. Another realization that we are not independent, but we are interdependent. Whether it is the air we breathe in the oceans or the weapons we send out, whatever way you want to look at it, we are not separate from the Middle East or any other part of this earth. And we can't even imagine that to be true anymore. This from Pema Chodron's new book, the places that scare you. A young woman wrote to me about finding herself in a small town in the Middle East, surrounded by people jeering, yelling, and threatening to throw stones at her and her friends because they were Americans. Of course she was terrified, and what happened to her then is interesting. Suddenly she identified with every person throughout history who had ever been scorned and hated. She understood what it was like to be despised for any reason. Ethnic group, the racism and racial background, sexual preference, gender. Something cracked wide open as she was quivering there and she stood anew in the shoes of millions of oppressed people and saw with a new perspective. She even understood her shared humanity with those who hated her. This sense of deep connection, of belonging to the same family, is the awakening of bodhicitta, the awakening of the heart of the Buddha. So the next realization we get when we become still is that we are not separate. We are in this together. Another truth that becomes more and more evident is that in this world of human form there is no permanent outer security. As Helen Keller says, security is mostly a superstition. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. So again from the Buddha, A student went to the Buddha and asked, why is it that I see some of the old men of the society going to offer animal sacrifices at the temples? And the Buddha answered, they offer these sacrifices because as they get older, they're nervous and they want to keep their lives as they are and and avoid all misfortunes. But Buddha, does it ever make a difference to their old age? Ah, said the Buddha, These offerings are all made on the basis of clinging to possessions and longings to keep things the way they are and not have them change. But as long as they act out of grasping in this way, it will make no difference to their old age. Then tell me, Buddha, if all the offerings of these kind don't help, what will help? The Buddha replied, The true sacrifice is not animals, but those who are willing to sacrifice greed, hatred, and delusion, to abandon them, to release them from the heart, to thoroughly understand their role within this body and mind, so that what arises in the world no longer agitates them. Then they become someone who is truly free from aging 
and sickness and death. Or another text from the Buddha where he speaks about how the lion, the king of beasts, will come forth and roar and all the animals will quiver and realize that they're listening to something great. And he said, in the same way, the enlightened ones too offer their lion's roar. And then part of this lion's roar says, it seems that although we thought ourselves permanent, we are not. And although we thought we would last forever, we will not. So it seems we are impermanent, unsettled, not lasting. And in fact, we do not possess even this very body and mind. This is part of the lion's roar of the Buddha. Not so easy to hear, is it, actually? This is called the wisdom of insecurity, that things aren't permanent, and they will change, and there is no forever the way they're supposed to be. I remember my teacher, Ajahn Chah, people would come to him with all kinds of questions. What is enlightenment? How will I know when I'm enlightened? What's going to happen? You know, it was the wartime when I lived there. What will happen to these countries, to Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos? You know, should I stay here? Should I go back? How should I live my life? What about the sorrows of the world? Will the world get better? And he would look back and he would say, my na, which is a phrase that means, my means not. Not certain, is it? To all these questions, it's not certain, is it? What's going to happen or what you should do or how the world will be. It's uncertain, isn't it? Can you live in that truth? Can you find the brave heart that understands that this is a world of change and rest in the reality of change, rest in the present moment as it is, rather than all the kind of fears of how it's supposed to be? It's so mysterious, evil, mara, unconsciousness, ignorance, greed, We don't understand it, really. I mean, everybody in the past great philosophers and religions tries to explain it. You know, are we headed for a great calamity in the world? The kind of realization of the worst fears, the (coughs) militarization of the world and all that could follow? (coughs) Or are we feeling the labor pains of the birth of a new world awareness? that the terrible things that have happened are leading us to find international law and justice and to to know that we're connected and to see the consequences of our actions as a call to justice. Could what we are seeing be recognized as a symptom? As the Buddha said, those who are not wise see the effects and those who are wise see the causes. Could we look into the causes of this and see them as a call for justice in the world, for people? You know, in the Greek tradition, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but in the Greek temples, the daughters of, uh, is it Themis? Um, are, her two daughters are the, uh, are the goddesses, first the goddess for peace. What is her name? I don't know how to pronounce it, like Irene. Somebody know? Somebody knows Greek here, come on. Um, And her sister, D.K., who um, is the goddess for justice. And before the goddess of peace can come out of the temple, her older sister, the goddess of justice, must arrive first. You don't get the goddess of peace until first you have had the goddess of justice. The Buddha puts it this way, people should be able to live without enduring poverty. Grain and other necessities should be given to farmers. Capital should be provided for traders and proper wages should be paid to those who are employed in a just society. When people have security and can earn an adequate income, they become contented without fear and worry. Because of this, 
the country will be at peace and there will not be crime from the Digha Nikaya. So even the Buddha looking into the causes reminds us of that task. So if this is a symptom, like a pain in the world's body, then we need to respond. But how do we respond? The Buddha again invites us to hold as medicine, to transform the suffering of the world in this way. Those who attain perfect wisdom are forever inspired by the conviction that the infinite variety forms of the world in all their manifestations, instead of being hindrance or dangerous distraction to their spiritual path, are the healing medicine. Why? Because by the very fact that they are interdependent on each other and have no separateness, they too express the mystery and the energy of all embracing love. Every single being in the interconnected world is a dweller in this boundless infinity of love. And what happens to us can awaken us to that truth. From the Prajnaparamita. Sometimes we individually in our personal lives or collectively experience very terrible medicine. The grieving in New York, so many people who died. What will we do with the medicine? In the Iroquois nation, there is a story of the founder, and if I remember his name correctly, it's Deganawida. I think I remember that correctly. And the Iroquois and the Seneca and the Cayuga and the Huron, the other various tribes, had at times warred, as tribes will. And there came a vision, this is back in the 1400s, to one of the leaders that the tribes might live in peace. And his name was Deganawida. And he began a campaign as a great leader of his own tribe to visit the elders of the other tribes and to try to create a greater nation that would have a a central council, the Iroquois Council, um, the Council of the Six Nations that became, some believe, the model for our own constitution. And he went and he visited several tribes and they agreed to uh, create a collective council of elders to peace, but not all the tribes would do it. And in fact, the leader of one was so bent on war and so against what Deganawida was doing that he went into the village of Deganawida while, while this man was going out trying to make peace and went to his own longhouse and killed his wife and his seven children. All right, that will put in that will put an end to this man trying to make peace. And when Deganawida came home, he wept and grieved and mourned. It said his, his cry was so loud that it echoed from the moon. So deep was his sorrow. And he went deep way into the far into the woods and he wept for a long, long time. And then what did he do? What could he do? He thought about his children that he'd lost and he thought about the wife that he'd lost. And he realized that if he didn't continue, their deaths would be for naught. And so he came out of the woods after wailing to the moon, and he began again his efforts to create peace, saddened by this, saddled by this great grief, and deepened by it, and somehow was able then to go and convince the other tribes And he did so by going going even to this elder who had slaughtered his family and offering him a branch of peace, a pipe of peace, and offering him forgiveness. And I guess I need to tell the story tonight so that you remember it is in our human history, it is in our genes, in our bodies, in our cells, in our collective hearts, that even in great difficulty with bravery, it can be turned around. What do we do with this mystery 
of good and evil, on birth and death and joy and sorrow. Listen deeply, quiet the mind, open the heart. Sense the timeless values beyond all the changes that come. What do you most deeply value? This is the quality of bodhicitta, of the awakened heart. And again, as it says in the Visuddhimagga, if the element of the truth seeker did not exist in you and in everyone, there would be no turning away from the entanglements and suffering of the world, nor could there be a longing for liberation, nor a seeking for it, nor a resolve to finding it, nor your awakening. But because this element of knowing the truth is there in every heart, it can awaken in you and me and everyone. Bodhicitta. And in fact, one of the things that everybody knows, even in the terrible weeks that have happened in New York, um, is how many acts of goodness have been born out of it. I mean, there have been story after story. I heard the story of a man from the, I don't know what it was, the 78th floor, who had a woman in a wheelchair that he bumped down 78 stories of that building in her wheelchair, and they both made it out. And the stories of people who waited on their floors and would go in and out of the bathroom and wet paper towels and hand them to put, give people to put over their mouths as they were descending the stairs in the midst of the burning building. There have been so many stories of brave hearts and of tenderness that have come out. Bodhicitta, the heart of the Bodhisattva. It is that place in us that can dedicate ourself to compassion and liberation no matter what happens in the world. Even if the sun should arise in the West, the Bodhisattva, the being committed to compassion, has only one way. So there are the vows one takes sometimes if you sit in the Zen monastery, before every single sitting. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to liberate them all. I offer this sitting practice, this practice of awakening, so that I might bring liberation to every single being. Sentient beings are numberless however long it takes. I mean, there's this whole great Buddhist vision of hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas, of eons of lifetime. So you don't have to think, oh my God, I've only saved two beings, you know. (laughs) How many more are left? And you're kind of crossing off the numbers on the list. What it means is that it's not in time, it is timeless. That the heart of the bodhisattva turns in the direction of compassion, is patient and fearless, and willing to build bridges again and again, no matter how many times they're broken. You know, there's a story um, that uh, Kurosawa, the great Japanese filmmaker, tells in a movie um, called Redbeard, one of his earlier films. And Redbeard was this old Japanese physician who ran a clinic for poor people out in one of the kind of outlying areas of an old Japanese city. And a young, new, kind of right out of medical training doctor came to work with Redbeard. And as the film tells the story, shortly after the young doctor arrived, a patient came into the clinic named Otoyo, who had been an orphan. And now she was a teenage girl. She was sold more or less into slavery into a brothel where she was beaten and made to clean everything every day and abused. And she came in and she was feverish and angry and mute. She would not speak a single word and and very, very sick. And the old Dr. Redbeard said, okay, here's your patient. 
And the young doctor did everything he could. He talked to her. He tried to cajole her. He tried to give her medicine to bring her fever down. And every time he approached her, she would yell at him or hit him or push him away. And finally he said, I have to bring her fever down. And he would pour medicine and try to give it to her. And he, he would just smack his hand and it would go all over him. And finally he threw up his hands in despair and went to the old doctor. Redbeard said, I cannot work with this woman. So then Kurosawa has the scene where Redbeard comes in and remember she hasn't spoken a word and her eyes are so mournful and yet she's agitated and she's cleaning and she's obviously fevered. And he sits down where she is next to her just quietly and watches her for a while. And then he pours out a spoon of the medicine and he goes over and he gently offers it to her mouth and she looks at him fiercely and smashes it out of his hand all over him. And he stands there quietly for a while, and then he pours out another spoon. And he offers it to her mouth, and she smashes it out of his hand, spills all over him, and ah, he stands there very quietly, and pours another spoon, walks over and gently offers it to her mouth. And she smashes out hand, only not quite as hard this time. Pours another spoon after he waits for a while offers it to her mouth and she pushes it away, you know, and it dribbles down him and he just stands there and waits and she cleans a little more and then he pours another spoon and he smiles a little bit. He's now starting to smile a little. He walks over to her and pauses and places it in her mouth and finally after like six or seven or eight times he puts the spoon in her mouth and she takes it and he puts the spoon down and walks out. And you see her there, and then she just sits down and starts to sob for a bit. And then in a short time after that, the first words she speaks to the young doctor, she looks up at him and says, Why didn't he hit me? Those are her words. Why didn't he hit me? Because he was probably the first person in her life who didn't hit her. The work of the bodhisattva The dedication of the heart is to build the bridge no matter how many times it is broken. And that is within us to do. To sit quietly, you are invited to see the world with the eyes of wisdom and the heart of compassion and to find your way to contribute your own small acts, the important steps you make, your own skillful means. The Buddha said the skillful means are like the sun shining that nourish the plants and melt the ice and move the waves. Each person finds their way to shine in this world. And your heart is trustworthy when you listen to it. Now in the Bhagavad Gita, the secret that's described, even in the face of war and calamity, The secret is to act without attachment to the result of your actions. To act with a pure intention. To plant the seeds in the garden of the world and know that eventually they will bear fruit. Again, Lao Tzu. A good traveler has no fixed plans and is not intent on arriving. A good artist lets their intuition lead them wherever it wants. A good scientist frees themselves of concepts and keeps their mind open. Thus the master is available to all and doesn't reject a single person. She is ready to use all situations and doesn't waste anything. This is called embodying the way. For what is a good man but a bad man's teacher? And what is a bad man but a good one's job? If you don't understand this, you will get lost however intelligent you think yourself to be. And if you do, the world will be transformed when you simply see it this way. This feels like an important time in our culture and in our lives. And as we act now, the results may come for a long time, individually and collectively. The more 
purely and thoughtfully your acts can come from the intention of compassion and of wisdom to see causes instead of results, the better seeds will grow in this world. And beauty will come from those seeds no matter how long it takes. When you plant beautiful seeds, what comes from them is beauty. I heard one of your sects teach that the universe was caused merely by chance, said a wanderer to the Buddha. You know, and in others, I wondered and I heard taught that um, you awoke and found bliss and truth, which was beautiful, and regard the universe as ugly and meaningless in comparison. And the Buddha said, I never taught such a thing, wanderer, but this is what I will say. Whoever awakes finds what is beautiful, knows what is beautiful, and knows indeed what it is to dwell in beauty. Hafiz, that Middle Eastern poet and sage, says, The eternal calls to every one of us. We can wait and go to the divine on a hospital stretcher, or we can dance, learn to dance where we are with that mysterious love that gave us birth even today. Let's sit for a moment. The purpose of meditation is not to give you the answers or the teachings of the Dharma, but to invite you to be still and listen to that beauty and true understanding that lies in your own heart. To have the courage to rest in this great mystery and plant seeds of goodness each day. Let's do a very simple chant before we go and then go out into this, what feels like a summer evening, huh? Warm summer evening, Indian summer. Thank you to the Indians. <sighs> Let's see. Just this one syllable chant. There's so many beautiful chants. You know, for those who haven't come before, There is a great Buddhist text called The Teachings of Complete and Perfect Wisdom in 80,000 verses. It's then summed up in 8,000 verses and in 800 verses. And for our sake tonight, fortunately, it is also summed up in one syllable. So you don't have to do a lot of reading. Um, And the reason this syllable is the sound of perfect wisdom is that it's considered the first sound and the last sound in life. It's the sound, most importantly, of opening or letting go. So we'll chant the seed syllable in Sanskrit, the seed syllable, ah. And as you do, let the ah release whatever encumbers your heart as best you can. And then we'll rest for a moment in the space after. Ah.
ah, add harmony to it, ah, 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 ah. keep it going, ah, happens this week, take, take time to sit quietly and listen deeply, to walk in the mountains or walk by the ocean. Take care and thank you. Thanks for your generosity and your support. And see you again. Good night.